Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Donna McPhee, a graduate of Columbia College from the class of 1989 and president of the Columbia Alumni Association and vice president for alumni relations for the university. And I'm excited to welcome you all to this special event for Columbia alumni. The CAA and our inspiring network of volunteers are working to develop virtual programs to continue to stay engaged with fellow alumni during these unprecedented times. And I hope many of you will join us regularly. Special thanks to Mink Young Kim, a graduate of Teachers College in 07, from our Southern California Regional Club for his leadership in making this program possible. Tonight, we're joined by two of Columbia's leading health experts who will share their thoughts and answer your questions on the current COVID-19 crisis. Dr. Melanie Burnitz is the Associate Vice President and Medical Director for Columbia Health and an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Center for Family and Community Medicine. She is a family physician with a master's in public health. With expertise in college health, family medicine, healthcare administration, and public health, Dr. Burnitz's experience includes nearly 20 years of teaching and training medical students, as well as overseeing primary care and prevention services on college campuses. As the head of Columbia Health, she supports the well being of over 28,000 students at Columbia. Dr. Wafa El Sadr is director of ICAP at Columbia University, university professor of epidemiology and medicine, and Mathilde Grimm Amfar, chair of global health. ICAP, the global health center she established at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health, works in more than 30 countries around the world with a staff of more than 1,800 persons addressing major public health challenges, including HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, emerging infections, maternal child health, and non-communicable disease through focus on strengthening health systems and enhancing indigenous capacity. The work involves training and mentorship, design, implementation, and scales up of innovative programs and conducts clinical epidemiological and implementation science research. At the conclusion of the doctor's remarks, you will be able to enter questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Also, many of you included questions when you registered. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to welcome Drs. Burnitz and L. Sater. And thank you very much, Donna. And um, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, here this evening. And uh, welcome to all the participants uh, to this webinar. Uh, I'm going to start by giving a perspective on the evolution of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and to give you a sense of the epidemiology and, uh, and some of the clinical features of the disease, as well as what we can do to control uh, this epidemic. So it's hard to imagine that was only maybe three and a half months ago that all of this started. And as many of you are aware, the first cases of uh, COVID-19 were identified uh, in late December in China in the city of Wuhan. Today, um, there are now almost uh, 2 million people, 1.9 million people around the world who have been confirmed to have COVID-19. So in just three and a half months, we a huge number of people have been diagnosed. In the US, there are currently more than half a million people who've also been diagnosed with COVID-19. And in New York City, right here, more than 100,000 people have been diagnosed with COVID-19. The pandemic has also had a huge impact in a lot of different ways, obviously on the lives of people who've been sick, but also in terms of uh, many thousands of people who have died, unfortunately, from COVID-19. It has also had enormous societal and economic effects, uh, not just here in the US, but all over the world. So the epidemic started in China and then uh, moved on to Europe. And several European countries have been very hard hit uh, by this pandemic. Some countries include um, Italy, Spain, Germany, and the United Kingdom. 
And each of these countries now have uh, larger numbers of cases than actually China had at the height of this uh, pandemic. Following the explosion of cases in Europe, uh, then the United States began to accumulate large numbers of cases right here in the US, ending up now with the epicenter of this epidemic right here in New York City, where the city has been severely impacted uh, by this epidemic. It's of interest that the epidemic also in New York City is distinguished by the disparities in the people that it affects the most. So there are more cases amongst people who are from lower socioeconomic classes, as well as those who come from ethnic and racial minorities, particularly Latinos and African Americans. In addition, um, the mortality has been noted to be higher among such ethnic and racial minorities. But let me step back and talk a bit about, about transmission of this virus. As all of you are likely aware, the virus affects the respiratory tract of individuals, of, of human beings, and thus the transmission is dependent on the expulsion of respiratory secretions that contain the virus. So these small droplets that contain the virus are the way that this is transmitted from one person to another. These droplets can usually, are usually greater than five microns in diameter, and they usually will settle down because they're rather heavy. They'll settle down to the ground, maybe within two or three feet. In addition, also, uh, COVID-19, the virus that causes COVID-19, can also be transmitted by contact. For example, if someone uh, sneezes in their hand and they expel some of these droplets into their palm and then they touch a surface, and then somebody else comes along and touches that same surface and then touches their own face, uh, then there's a possibility of transmission through contact in this way. Our knowledge of how the, the virus is transmitted has evolved substantially over the last few weeks, uh, just a few weeks. We now know that not only are people who have symptoms, that is people who are sneezing or coughing, able to transmit this virus, but even people who are without symptoms can still carry and shed the virus in their secretions and are able to transmit to others. So this has meant that we have to be not only uh, conscious of people who have symptoms, but also some other people who have no symptoms because both can transmit this virus to others. Now, just to give you a sense about the clinical manifestations, usually from the infection till a person develops symptoms is usually between about two days to about 14 days. And when people develop symptoms, uh, the symptoms are usually in the vast majority of people, mild to moderate, 80% of people have mild to moderate symptoms and most of them recover. About 15% of people have severe symptoms and about 5% have critical or critically ill. And those are the individuals that often need to be hospitalized and require substantial supportive, supportive care. Now we, we know now that not only is this virus highly transmissible, even more highly transmissible than many, many other respiratory virus, but we also know it's more deadly than other respiratory infection, more deadly than influenza, for example. And the mortality from uh, COVID-19 varies also substantially across countries, with as high as 12% of people with COVID-19 dying in Italy, for example, while as low as 2% in Germany. Why is there such a big gap, in this, this big span between these countries? It's a lot of different reasons. It depends who's affected and depends, of course, on the availability of sophisticated uh, healthcare. So Italy, a substantial proportion, about 36% of people who've been affected with COVID-19 have been 70 years or older. And what we know now is there's some subgroups amongst the populations that are more likely to have severe illness. For example, those who are older in age, as well as those with underlying serious medical conditions like lung disease, chronic lung disease, high blood pressure, obesity, and also uh, any immune suppressive uh, conditions. Now, how just quickly to touch on how do we control, how can we control uh, this pandemic? There are some things that each and every one of us can do, individual behaviors that are very critical and that have been shown to decrease the transmission from one person to another. Very importantly, of course, is if somebody's sick, they need to stay at home because we want to avoid a contact between somebody who's sick and somebody who's susceptible to the infection. So it's really important when someone has symptoms that are suggestive 
of COVID-19 or any symptoms to stay at home, not go to work, not go outside. Frequent hand washing has also been shown to be very effective in prevention of transmission of really almost all of the viral infections. So that's really critical and it's important to wash hands thoroughly for at least 20 seconds. In addition, also, it's advisable never to sneeze or cough in one's palm uh, or hand for the reason that I mentioned before, because that also could transmit the infection uh, from one person uh, to another person. Now, there are other things that we can do as well in order to control uh, this epidemic, and some of those have already been put in place in several countries around the world. When the numbers of cases initially are small, Every effort must be made by the public health system to identify people who are infected, test them, identify cases, and then isolate those cases to prevent them from transmitting to others. At the same time, also, a huge effort is required by public health in order to identify those close contacts to this case and to quarantine close contacts until we know for sure they're not infected. However, when the numbers of cases increase substantially, like it is now in New York and in many other cities in the United States, as well as in European countries, it becomes impossible to track every case and track every contact. And at this point, then we move to control and mitigation measures. And those are the ones that we are experiencing now in the US. And essentially these mitigation measures aim to do one thing. And the most important thing is to prevent uh, contact between people and therefore prevent transmission. So for example, closing schools and closing businesses and uh, restricting travel from one place to another, as well as uh, maintaining social or physical distancing between individuals by at least uh, six feet or so. So it's a combination of all these measures that need to be put in place and to be sustained until we turn the corner, until we're sure that we've controlled uh, the numbers of new infections, and that the health system is able to cope with the numbers of patients. And then, and only then, we ha can consider potentially trying to relax some of these measures. But for now, because of the situation that's in the United States now and many, many other countries around the world, it is absolutely critical to sustain the mitigation and prevention methods that we have put in place. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Melanie. Bernitz, and she's going to continue to um, give you some of her insights. Thank you so much, Wafa. Um, thank you, Donna, for the lovely introduction and good evening or good morning or good afternoon to all our participants. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. And I wanted to share a brief overview of the policies implemented to ensure the health of our Columbia campuses um, and some insights into the outside agencies providing support. Um, for Columbia, we started focusing efforts on the COVID-19 response back in mid-January, um, so, so just about three months ago. Um, we have an infectious disease working group, which is a subset of the university's emergency management operations team. Actually, that group was formed back in 2008 as a response to pandemic flu. And since then, the group meets at least once per semester and more often is needed to ensure that the university can respond to any emerging infectious disease threat. And that group has representation from a wide range of key offices across the university, including Columbia Health, where I work, public safety, campus services, facilities, the provost office, human resources, communications, environmental health and safety, um, risk management, dining, housing, with expertise from epidemiology and public health. And we also work with our affiliates at Barnard, Teachers College, JTS and UTS. Um, in the past, we've met to establish responses to flu or meningitis, Ebola, Zika and others. And we actually started meeting back in mid-January and have been meeting weekly since then to ensure really there's proper cooperation and collaboration across campus and to review the current status of the outbreak, the campus needs and action plans as the situation grows. And so this group really helped provide the response um, for the university initially around the needs of returning travelers and then around the broader pandemic response response plan known as the COVID-19 response plan, which has been operationalized in guiding the university's response um, during this pandemic. 
Very early on, the university leadership convened the COVID-19 task force, and that brings together university senior leadership, along with public health, epidemiology, and infectious disease experts from Columbia University and Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And this group has been meeting daily, um, sometimes two or three times a daily, including nights and weekends, to ensure that the university is responding and reacting in real time and proactively around all elements of the COVID-19 response. Um, and this task force was charged with operationalizing the, the response plan that I described, um, which was ratified by President Bollinger. And that plan has been guiding our institution in planning and reviewing and implementing the various contingencies we've had to go through as a university, as we've seen the impact of COVID-19 on our population initially, internationally then as the, the, the virus um, was in the US and then as New York City really became the, the epicenter. Um, each phase had detailed plans to implement um, so that the university really had the building blocks in place um, before we reached any phases of the plan. Um, the university also has the emergency management operations team which can be, continues to convene twice a week to ensure um, implementation of the plan can occur. Um, right away, the university set up the preparedness website with frequently asked questions um, being updated daily. Pulling from the emails and phone call questions we were getting, we also set up a university COVID-19 hotline on March 8th um, to take calls um, and inquiries from our community and, and assist in, in guiding them. To date, that, that hotline received over 2,000 calls. Um, and the university created the COVID-19 landing page. So if you go to the main columbia.edu page, you can see that landing page, which has just got listed numerous, numerous resources. Uh, throughout this, um, we've been in constant contact with the New York City Department of Health, um, reviewing all of their updates and working closely with them to get real-time guidance, initially um, working with them on contact tracing and now on the mitigation efforts. We've also been in close contact with our Ivy Plus peer colleagues and counterparts at other institutions in New York City, so we're all sharing resources and approaches, um, really with the goal, of course, being to support the health and well-being of the Columbia community as the situation involved, evolves. There have been numerous layers of communication to the community starting back in January with dozens of messages, including community health advisories um, from me that discuss what we knew at different stages of this outbreak around transmission that you've heard about and symptoms, travel restrictions, updating our community on the CDC recommendations, self-care prevention and so on. And we can certainly discuss much of that in the Q&A section. Um, as we've begun to see as we began to see the transmission in New York City, we provided information on social distancing um, and more recently on, on, on how that should be implemented um, in terms of the physical distancing and then the face coverings again, which we can discuss some, some more. So the status currently, um, as, as Dr. Alsada described, is the widespread transmission in New York City. So we're no longer doing the contact tracing. And it's also important to realize that there is limited testing available um, in the United States generally. And that means testing is really being reserved for the more serious cases, those requiring hospitalization and where the result of the test will change the management. So for outpatients, um, for example, someone needing chemotherapy or dialysis, the test result may change change the outcome. Um, but for the mild cases, which account for about 80% of cases, there may not be availability of testing. Uh, and the, um, the recommendations for how to manage that case will, will not change based on the result. So, that, so the things that we've described, staying home, if you're feeling sick, connecting with your clinician to get some guidance, but not necessarily um, getting a test. Um, there are many resources available for our community around the virtual instruction, around all the different resources. So certainly check out the, the web pages. Um, and as Dr. Alsada described, the parts that we all play are staying home as much as we possibly can, supporting friends and families, or if you're an essential worker, taking all necessary precautions as you go about your work. Um, with that, broad introduction, I want to pass it back to, to Donna. Um, so we would be very happy to take the questions that you've submitted. I'm still muted. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Melanie and Wafa. That was a great introduction um, and sharing your perspectives, advice, and insight 
um, to our community. So we have a couple of questions and I'll start with um, the first, the first one, the first one, that first one that came different from others such that it has proven to be much more transmissible than others like SARS or MERS. Could, could you just repeat you just the question? Can you repeat the question? We, Broke up you, a little. We yeah. couldn't hear you. For, <laughs> repeat it, please. Can you hear me, can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. What makes this coronavirus different from others such that it has proven to be much more transmissible than others like SARS and MERS? I think it's um, uh, different kinds of viruses have different characteristics and uh, it's unclear exactly why this one is more transmissible than the others, but each virus has a different uh, uh, rate of transmission. There's something we call R0, which is the average number of people, of individuals that can be infected from one person who's, who's, who's infected with a virus. And I think we, we don't know for sure what it's gonna be like for uh, this virus in particular, but it's about between three and four, it's estimated. Uh, so I think there are other viruses that are much more transmissible, like measles, for example. But nonetheless, it is a high, this is a highly transmissible virus if, you can, if one person can, on average, transmit to more than two people. And I think the other piece, just to add to that, is this is a novel virus. So this was never seen in humans before. So no one has immunity to this virus. And that's why you're seeing so much transmission with other viruses like measles. While they're highly transmissible, a large percentage of the population has immunity. In this case, that, that immunity is not there yet. Exactly. How is it determined how long the virus can survive on different types of surfaces? This, this is a question that's constantly yes. coming up. Yeah. Um, so there, there's been a lot published and I'll start and then I'll turn it to, to Wafa. Um, uh, the studies that you read about where it talks about how many hours the virus lasts on surfaces, these studies are done in lab settings. Um, so in these perfect conditions. So when you read that it can last on a certain surface for nine days, that's in a lab setting and that's not really how the real world works. Is it likely that it's surviving on surfaces and being transmitted that way? Absolutely. But the length of time, I think, is definitely up for some debate. That's why all these pieces that we talk about, they're constant hand washing. That's the best way to prevent transferring virus from a surface and in inadvertently becoming infected. We are hearing mixed messages about whether it is okay to exercise outdoors. Official messaging has been that it is okay to exercise outdoors as long as you maintain six feet distance from others. There have been some public statements by medical providers that it's better to just stay home as close to 100% of the time as possible. Could you please comment? Sure, I can comment. I think, um, yes, ideally, if people can stay at home 100% of the time, that would be ideal. But nonetheless, we also recognize that it's sometimes very hard to do so. And I think if going out to exercise can enhance somebody's uh, mental health and uh, enable them to stay longer indoors alone uh, and to be able to do social distancing, then it's perfectly okay to do so. But then even uh, anytime one is outdoors, one has to maintain uh, social distancing, whether they're exercising or they're sitting or they're standing next to anyone else. So ideally 100%, but we also recognize that's that sometimes that's very difficult, particularly again for families with young children and so on. It's uh, very, very difficult to maintain everybody indoors for, this, for many weeks, uh, uh, for many subsequent weeks like we have been now in New York City. What role do you see from universal testing as part of our strategy to start to normalize? The testing is, is the million dollar question here. So there's two pieces to the testing. The one is the diagnostic testing that I touched on just before. And that's obviously testing someone to see if they are actively have the virus right now. That's what you're hearing with the nasal swabs. Um, with the testing where some countries have done a really good job of having widespread availability of testing within the United States. Currently, we don't have such widespread availability of testing. And that is somewhat um, difficult because you, you have no way of proving if someone actively has the infection. 
The second piece of testing, which is getting a lot of buzz right now, is around the antibody testing. And that's the, the blood test to look at serology to see if someone has previously been infected with the, the virus. That would be your body produced, having an immune response and producing antibodies that show that you've had a previous infection. That would be the way of knowing even people who were never tested with a diagnostic test or maybe never had symptoms are now immune to the virus. That is not widely available yet, um, but I think wider availability on both types of testing will certainly be helpful as we enter the recovery phase and, and the return to normal. Wofford, do you have more to say on that? No, no, I think that's uh, exactly right. And I think there are the beginning now of efforts to do um, serological testing to look for antibodies in specific populations. And hopefully when, we, uh, when these kinds of studies are done, we'll have a sense of what proportion of the population has been infected and hopefully are immune. We're not 100% sure that they will be immune, but we suspect that people who have recovered from the COVID-19 infection will be immune. So that will give us a sense of where, uh, how much of a herd immunity has been accomplished in, a pop in our population. Um, and talk to us about um, face covering and masks. Sure, maybe you wanna start Melanie? Sure. <laughs> Um, so, so we've gone through many iterations of masks and face coverings. So early on, um, we certainly know there are cultural differences in how people wear masks and why people wear masks. And initially, we really were reinforcing that masks are great in the healthcare setting for healthcare workers and are great for people who are symptomatic as a way of preventing for, so for symptomatic people, a mask will prevent you transmitting virus to other people. And obviously healthcare workers, when they're working in spaces with people who are infected or doing procedures, it is to protect them. Um, also, especially in the United States, there have been shortages of masks and really wanting to save the supply for those who need it to do their essential work in healthcare. Within the last week, we've had changed guidance coming from the CDC and nationally in the United States. And that's around face coverings. And I really wanna mark the difference between face coverings and masks. As we're learning more and more about this virus, realizing that there can potentially be transmission of this virus from people who don't have symptoms, so from asymptomatic people, not necessarily transmitting it through a cough or a sneeze, but maybe from loud talking or from laughter or from singing. And also realizing that there's places where that social or that physical distancing is difficult. For example, in the grocery store, where it's not that easy to stay six feet apart from people. And that's where the face covering recommendation has come in. So saying, if you do need to go out for an essential reason, like going to the grocery store or going to the pharmacy, then cover your face because that will prevent you inadvertently transmitting virus to other people should you be one of those people who does not currently have symptoms. What's important about those face coverings is to make sure they cover your nose, your mouth and your chin, um, and that they are obviously of a breathable fabric so you can fashion, there's a lot of videos out there about how to fashion your own out of a t-shirt or a dishcloth or, or a bandana. I think the Surgeon General shows one with mm -hmm. a bandana. Um, but then not getting into a false sense of security with it either. You know, if virus is on the outside of your face covering and then you touch it with your hands, you could potentially be transmitting virus if you don't wash your hands afterwards. So really using the face covering when you have to go out in public in places where that physical distancing is difficult. And it's important to highlight, as many said, it's largely to protect other people. It doesn't protect you, it protects others in case you do have infection and you don't know that you're infected as of yet. What about envelopes, packages, deliveries, groceries? What are the recommendations? Um, you hear three days, I, you hear you don't have to wash them. Um, I can tackle this one. I, I think I, I would always go, I always go back and say that the frequent hand washing is a very good piece of advice. So if you get a package, for example, and you, um, you can, undo the package and you can throw away the packaging and you need to wash your hands afterwards. And I think that's good practical advice. And that's the most important thing is washing your hands. So you're not contaminating your hands. I think also um, people have asked about vegetables and fruits. And I personally think it's a good idea to wash vegetables and fruits when you get them from the market because they may have been handled by somebody else with their hands. And therefore this is again, good advice to wash 
anything that could have been touched by somebody else, particularly if you're going to eat it directly. How has the U.S. government, the CDC, the NIH, et cetera, engaged with Colombia? There are, uh, I can start. I mean, I think um, uh, several of us at Columbia have, um, have long history of working with CDC as well as working with NIH. Uh, working with CDC, I, we have personally at, uh, we have at ICAP worked with CDC for many years, both domestically here in the US as well as in the countries where we work overseas. And we've been very involved in uh, trying to put in place in collaboration with the CDC in many countries in Africa, for example, supporting the governments there in putting all these measures in place, uh, enhancing their laboratory capacity, as well as the surveillance capacity and so on. So we've worked hand in hand with the CDC in many countries around the world, both in Asia and in Africa. In, uh, in, in addition, uh, there are lots of researchers at Columbia that are doing work and research supported by NIH, uh, both in terms of trying to understand the disease better, uh, also to conduct uh, zero surveys, and, and as well as also to do some pathogenesis work um, on, on, on the virus itself. So there are strong relationships. There's always been a very vibrant uh, collaboration between Columbia as a university and its various schools with these uh, two funding agencies. And I think that's now continues, but I think uh, a lot of uh, additional work that's been added uh, largely to respond to the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. And where do you see Columbia's role with regard to um, studies about coronavirus, for example, they've been talking about um, the elderly, they've been talking about race having impact, socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there will be lots of research done um, about this pandemic and what role will the School of Public Health and the Medical Center and the university play? There already are several uh several faculty members and, and groups of faculty members, uh, I know at the School of Public Health and the medical school as well, who've been very interested in understanding the dynamics of, uh, of this virus and what it means, and particularly trying to dissect this issue of disparities and uh, the, the, the big burden that uh, certain ethnic racial mi minorities as well as other vulnerable populations are facing. In addition, there are also you know, other schools at the universities that are doing fascinating work. For example, the School of Engineering is uh, trying to identify and uh, new testing methodologies as well as new protective uh, equipment. Uh, so there are lots of schools uh, and amongst many others, there are lots of schools that are trying very hard to understand the dy many of the dimensions of this virus all the way from, pathology, from pathogenesis uh, to public health to clinical care to development of therapeutics, uh, medications that hopefully can uh, control the uh, and uh, control the, the virus itself, as well as also how to respond to the epidemic through development of protective devices and diagnostics. And I think that ability from Columbia's side to kind of amp up the research very rapidly, we saw that in the early weeks of seeing our first patients in New York City, that Columbia was able to bring online um, in-house testing and bring that to New York Presbyterian Hospital. So to be able to do a volume of tests based on our researchers and our development um, far more quickly than had we been waiting for commercially available products. So I think we'll continue to see that sort of de development coming from Columbia's researchers. There's also been also um, work at, um, for example, at the School of Public Health in terms of modeling uh, this epidemic, which has been very important because everybody's asking these questions like, what, what should we expect? When are we going to flatten the curve? Uh, what's the recovery going to look like? And uh, there are groups of modelers that have worked very hard using as much of the data as available to try to project what's going to happen next and to do very sophisticated modeling of this epidemic. So let's talk about that modeling and um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions that have come in about um, a possible second wave of the infection. Can you get it again? How accurate is the testing? Do you um, develop antibodies 100% of the time? Are you watching potential hotspots in the US um, to especially looking at New York City and where Columbia's campuses are? 
So, so I'll, I'll start and then I'll hand it over. So certainly we're watching that. And the task force that Wafa and I both are on every day starts with a review of what's happening at the global level, the national level and the local level. So really are tracking all of that using all available modeling. And what we're hearing, particularly in New York City, is this question, are we at the peak? Um, there's some uncertainty to that. We don't know we're at the peak till after the peak is over and we see which direction we're heading. So what we're seeing right now in New York City is potentially a flattening of cases. That means the number of cases each day is not going up, but we have to wait and see what happens. Is this the start of the decline? Are we gonna start seeing cases go down or is it just a plateau and then there's another wave going up? So I think looking at the modeling and then looking at all the different variables that feed into those case numbers it is really important. Um, whether or not that leads to a second wave, I think is based on a multitude of factors that have not yet been determined fully. A lot of that is how we respond um, as a local community and then I guess nationally as well. So what does it look like when all these restrictions start to get relaxed? How slowly, how, how is that rolled out? Um, what, what does kind of normal look like uh, in the new world? And that's gonna feed into whether or not we see um, the second wave. Back to what Wafa said earlier, a lot of that is the unknown right now. We don't know what percentage of our population is immune. So with more testing, as we start to get that information, I think that will help define what the coming months will look like. Wafa? Just to add to what Melanie just said, I think an, an important issue that always arises is whether uh, people can get reinfected. Um, and uh, I think um, uh, there's been one small study that was done in China where they followed uh, patients who had uh, a resolution of their symptoms, they were feeling good, and uh, the swabs from their nasal pharynx uh, had turned negative for two days or several days, and then they turned positive again, meaning that they were able to show that the virus was, was being shed again by that individual who had uh, recovered from the illness. Uh, I don't think that proves that this individual got reinfected. We're not sure whether this is just a sampling, that the samples that were negative just because of the, the way the samples were taken or the test itself. Uh, so there's no evidence that people have gotten uh, reinfected. I think the other question that's related to this is about immunity. And uh, as I mentioned, whether people develop immunity, immune, whether the individuals who develop antibodies will be immune to another infection. It's going to really depend. We don't know that as of yet. It's going to depend on what kinds of antibodies people develop. And certainly we have information and also it depends on the assays that test themselves and how good they are. Uh, the tests that are available now are not great uh, because they have a lot of negatives, false negatives. We don't know if that's a true negative or a false negative. Uh, antibody. So I think there's going to be the need for a lot more research to identify when do people uh, develop antibodies, which types of antibodies, and also are these antibodies protective or not, and how long are they protective for? Um, do you believe that the U.S. will open with a big bang by the beginning of May, according to Trump? Um, <laughs> avoiding politics, um, as we've described, I don't think opening as a big bang is the best way to, to move forward. Relaxation of restrictions have to happen slowly, gradually, and have other pieces in place. Um, it, we will then move into the recovery phase where it's going to be important when there are cases to be able to rapidly identify them, isolate them, um, contact trace, and also to ensure that we don't have such a rebound of cases that we overwhelm our healthcare resources. So I think the only way to do that safely is with gradual restrictions. I think we're watching very closely what's happening in China. I'm, I'm going to learn from the experience there in terms of the way um, restrictions are being relaxed. Um, but but I, I, I don't know that just suddenly saying, oh, we've got this under control by the beginning of May it is going to be um, possible or probable. I agree. And I think we're also going to learn from Europe 
because I think some of the countries in Europe now are are phasing uh, and uh, loosening some of the restrictions and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens there. I think what we don't want is to have an immediate rebound. I think that will be really uh, a very um, unfortunate situation and therefore the loosening of the restrictions has to be done very thoughtfully and incrementally and be driven by evidence and data. So further um, talking about Europe, what are your thoughts on Sweden and their completely different approach to stay at home? Well, Sweden took a chance and, um, and that was a risky, uh, risky chance that they took. They, uh, initially, they really were one of the few countries in Europe that uh, resisted putting in place mitigation measures uh, as other countries, European countries have done. Uh, they um, believed, and this is all based on what I've read, but they believed that the culture in Sweden, uh, that people by their nature kind of distance uh, or they have more physical distancing than other countries. I don't know if that's true or not. But I think now they're beginning, they've begun to see a boldness of new infections. And I think they're revisiting that initial strategy and, uh, and have put in place more mitigation measures because they realized that the initial approach was not successful. How, um, how long after you get the illness are you contagious? That's a great question. So um, it varies um, and depends for many people. So as Wafa described earlier, the incubation period, so the time from when you've been exposed to when you actually may develop the illness can range anywhere from two to 14 days. And then we see a wide range. So when someone is diagnosed with the infection or first becomes symptomatic, the minimum period we think they're symptomatic is seven days. Um, so the, the, the minimum time we will tell someone to isolate themselves for is seven days from the onset of their symptoms. They also have to demonstrate at least three days of no fever without the use of fever reducing medications. And if they never had a fever, at least three days with um, improvement of the other symptoms like cough or shortness of breath. So the minimum time, as I say, will be seven days while that someone's considered contagious, but it can go on for much longer. People can have a fever that lasts for several weeks with this infection. Um, so everyone's course is different and will be guided um, by your clinician as you discuss your symptoms with them in terms of when it's safe to come out um, of isolation. But as I say, a minimum of seven days. Um, if testing is available, um, which isn't widely available in all areas, but two negative tests um, separated by 24 hours um, is also considered um, able to discontinue isolation. So we do have an undergraduate student who is listening. Um, and asking questions about the students and um, the school opening um, in the fall. I know we may not have an answer, but um, I thought I'd ask. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we're all hoping for a normal fall semester. I think it's too early to make that decision. The university just made the decision that summer will be online only. And that announcement was made just last week. So I think the next few weeks in terms of seeing what happens, what direction this goes, and then if we start to see relaxation of the restrictions, seeing what happens, then those two things are going to play into the decision about having a normal um, for in-person fall semester. So a little too early to say, but we are mm -hmm. all holding out hope that that will happen, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so um, a couple of questions of, uh, came up about um, alumni, especially those overseas, helping the situation in New York. Um, and I'd like to give a shout out to a group of alumni across Asia who shipped over a significant mm -hmm. package of masks and PPE um, to Thomas Lowe, who is the president of the Vagelos Physicians and Surgeons Alumni Association and making sure that um, our medical staff has what they need to properly treat and help the patients. But what advice do you have to those who are looking to help? Well, I think that uh, if it's at all possible, I think that the continued support for all the 
shortages that we still have here uh, in this country is deeply appreciated. I am aware that uh, even um, we at, um, uh, at Mailman uh, benefit from, benefited from some of these donations because there were some clinical sites that did not have any PPEs. So I think being uh, staying connected and trying to respond to some of the needs and the diverse needs as they arise would also be incredibly important. And, and the, any donations are enormously appreciated, particularly in this very difficult time now. I think we're also learning. I think uh, it, it would be great if there are ways of communicating the experiences that all of you uh, are having in other countries around the world in terms of uh, experiences with the mitigation measures and the relaxation of the mitigation measures and so on. I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other as we're all tackling this epidemic in different, very different stages of its, uh, of its evolution. Um, so I think uh, having open lines of communication and sharing uh, would be incredibly important. And Melanie, there are students on campus and I know there is a um, campaign to raise funds to help those students and other students um, who had to move quickly off of campus. Um, do you want to share a bit about the students on campus and yeah. how we can help them? Absolutely. So very rapidly, uh, the, the second weekend in March, as we started to see the situation really change in New York City, our undergraduate students were encouraged to leave if they possibly could. Um, we usually have 5,400 undergraduate students living on campus. That number is down to 350 right now. So many of our students were able to leave. And I, I know through generosity of the alumni, many students received financial support um, to assist with moving or storing or packing um, and things like that. We do have students who've remained on campus because of ex exceptional circumstances. Um, we managed to thin out our residential community to try and keep them as safe as possible. So they're all in singles, no one's living in a double. Um, suites that are for four people only have two people in them. Suites that are for six people only have three people. So really trying to reduce the number of people sharing bathrooms and common areas. Um, dining has moved to a grab and go. So no sitting and dining, food is packaged and take, taken back. Lounges are closed, gyms are closed. So not really the fun Columbia you all know and, and remember, but obviously doing as much as we can to keep our students safe and then supporting their financial needs um, during this time when many students who maybe previously worked are unable to work or unable to get home. So that's some of what's been happening with our undergraduate students. Um, we still have our medical services available, um, all of our services through Columbia Health, I should add, available to them. We have an on-site medical service still available, and then all our other support services are available virtually, so counseling um, through Zoom like this, um, other medical visits through Zoom, and all the other support through health promotion, disability services, and sexual violence response. So actually, regardless of where our students are, they can continue to receive support from us. Great, that's wonderful. Um, and we do have on our website a new page, Building uh, Columbia Community, which is on alumni.columbia.edu. And we um, gather what is happening up at the medical center, um, certainly with our schools that are doing research, um, as well as some of our experts where they talk about the economic impact as well on our website. So please visit it um, to gather more information and to find out. Um, we have links to other areas Areas at the university where you can learn more. Um, so uh, two last questions. Um, one is we, we did and we talked about soap and washing hands earlier um, and there's a question about um, uh, washing hands and surfaces and how long it lasts on surfaces. The clothes of infected people are supposed to be washed with soap. Any more information on type of soap, how long, anything that um, our alums should know? I think soap has been shown to actually destroy the surface of the virus itself. So it's really good to wash hands with soap as, and to wash uh, clothes and so on with soap. It's also important for it to be soaking. And that's the reason why we say that the washing of the hands has to be all the surfaces for a, for a certain period of time. 
I think also people have the option of using the hand sanitizers, which are available if soap and water is not available, uh, but it has to have a very high alcohol level, more than 60% alcohol. Uh, I know that not all communities, we work in many places around the world, in Africa and so on, where running water is, um, is not available and, and soap is difficult to find. Uh, so I think we try as much as possible to encourage people to use whatever they have running water, better than nothing. Hand sanitizers are often not available, but at least uh, to continue to wash hands with water as much as possible. Great. Will the impact of COVID be stronger in Latin America and Africa than in the US and Europe because of greater poverty? This is something that uh, we've been particularly concerned about. And uh, that's the reason I mentioned we've been working very closely with uh, the ministries of health and academic institutions and civil society groups to get these countries prepared uh, to respond uh, to this pandemic. The fear is that uh, for uh, particularly because of the health care systems are much more fragile than they are in highly resourced countries like in the US or Western Europe, for example, or, or uh, Asian countries as well, is that they, these, these um, services will be very quickly overwhelmed. It's acknowledged that there, even as we struggled here in New York to find sufficient intensive care unit beds as well as ventilators, you can imagine that in some countries in Africa, there are no ventilators at all and no intensive care beds at all. So I think the hope is that uh, by working diligently and uh, very aggressively if we're able to use public health measures, particularly the ones that I mentioned earlier, like containment, to identify people who are uh, who, cases very quickly, use testing, and then do that contact tracing and try to, again, quarantine the contacts. We're hoping that we will prevent uh, the, this epidemic from taking off in many of these countries, because if you let it go, then the numbers of cases becomes overwhelming and the health systems will be completely overwhelmed. The situation is similar in some Latin American countries as well. I'm very concerned by the numbers of cases in, uh, for example, in uh, Brazil, uh, almost 20,000 cases in Peru in Chile and many other um, uh, Latin American countries. So I think there is certainly a reason for concern uh, for low and middle income countries around the world. And I think we have a responsibility. I always say that even though we have a lot of, a lot of challenges here in our country, we do still have a responsibility to try and help as much as possible. Uh, I always say that epidemics don't know borders and we've learned that uh, from this epidemic and therefore we have to really truly believe that to control our own epidemic, we need to control the epidemic everywhere else. Wonderful. Well, Thank you to the two of you, Wafa and Melanie. You certainly have educated us. Are there any last remarks or advice or thoughts you want to share? Um, there were so many, and I'm sure we didn't get to answer so many of the questions, but really just to stay informed, um, to use reputable sources of information. Wafa taught me very early on communication, 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 sharing the information that we have so the right information gets out, um, and taking care of yourselves um, wherever you are in the world, wherever this, this virus is in terms of staying safe, um, staying home as much as you can, following all the precautions um, to reduce transmission, and then reaching out if we can be of any assistance in answering any of the questions. And I just add to Melanie, everything she said is absolutely right. And to also we count on all of you to amplify these messages, to let the people around you know uh, what the facts are. So because during times like this, there are lots of rumors and myths that arise as well as to be also supportive of other people in, the in your communities, because um, it is very difficult for vulnerable groups to try to deal with uh, COVID-19. And the more we can support each other, I think in the end, the better off we're all gonna be. Wonderful, well, thank you both so much. Um, we please to the alumni and the, a student, maybe even multiple students on the, um, Zoom recording. If you have um, any additional questions, 
send them our way and we will forward them um, to Dr. L. Sauter and Dr. Bernitz. Um, and I thank you for joining and I will give a shout out. Um, I've been looking at the Q&A and we have Alex from Mexico City and David from Hong Kong who chimed in and Johnny from Taipei and I'm sure many of you from all over the world. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being engaged and staying connected to Columbia. Um, and if you have any questions, reach out to us. You can reach out to me at dhm18 at columbia.edu. And I hope you will join us for more programming. And most importantly, um, to you and your families, stay well, stay safe and healthy. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Have thank a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.